Um, but uh, each of the speakers today will have um, about 30 minutes and a couple of minutes for, I think we'll handle questions right after each of the presentations so that you can uh, speak to each person as they're still up here. Um, I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves as they would like to um, frame their discussion. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce I. Williams Artman, um, who is here to talk about ripeness, the unanswered question for a Middle East dialogue. Good. Good beginning. I have no mic and no light. Your mic That's is right here. Oh, is that my mic? Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. I do have a mic. Oh, okay. And, yeah. well, I'm, I'm here to, to sell. I'm from SAIS. Um, I guess my biography is somewhere or other in the program, or maybe not. Maybe you know. Um, I'm here to sell ripeness and ripeness in the Middle East context. Uh, and uh, uh, use it to explain both some things that have happened and some things that haven't happened uh, in the Middle East and some things that our policymakers should be uh, aware of. Um, the basic idea of ripeness is that uh, we don't do things unless we have to. Uh, parties want to solve problems uh, unilaterally uh, and they only turn to multilateral solutions, that is to negotiated uh, uh, solutions to conflicts uh, when they feel themselves blocked in a unilateral uh, action, uh, when they feel themselves stalemated. Um, however, uh, the, uh, we live through many stalemates in our life. Uh, we learn to get used to them and so on, and we really uh, don't do much about them unless they start hurting us. And then we feel compelled to get rid of the stalemate, uh, get rid of the hurt by getting rid of the of the stalemate. Uh, and at that point, uh, we turn to, uh, we are open to suggestions or we discover ourselves that we could, should turn to the other party who's part of the problem or part of the conflict and try to find a multilateral, bilateral, or whatever solution situation out of the, uh, out of the conflict. But even that is, is not enough because uh, we can be stalemated, but the other party feels fine. Um, and so the stalemate must be mutual. Hence, a mutually hurting stalemate, a, a phrase that I hope you have heard uh, before, MHS sometimes referred to as, um, is the, the uh, key to the opening of a, a willingness to discuss a solution. It is not a guarantee of a solution. A mutually hurting stalemate is not self-enforcing or self-enacting, uh, but is rather something that either the parties or a mediator can take advantage of and move them then into, uh, into discussions on a, on a conflict. Um, a mutually hurting stalemate is a, a subjective fact, not an objective fact. It's helped by objective facts. Um, it, if I uh, want to walk through a door that's not there, uh, even though my subjective desires are, are there, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't help. Uh, but if I don't see that there's a door there, um, and, but there is a door, then I can be persuaded, or at least it can be suggested to me, that, uh, that there is a door, that there is a way out. And so there must be also a perception shared by the parties that there's a way out of this, that, that together uh, we can find something. It doesn't have to be anything specific, but that there's a willingness on each party, hence a, mutually, a mutual sense of a way out. Again, a perception um, that we can get out of this uh, by cooperating uh, together. The, the importance of the subjective element is not just the definitional uh, importance, but also a, a very important operational uh, uh, aspect, because that means that uh, if there is a door and I say, I'm locked in this room, if somebody can come up and say, but see, there's a door there. And then I will agree to turn around rather than facing the view and look at the door and see that I can get out. It opens the possibility then for a mediator to come in and point out that there is, first of all, that you're in a mess, that you are in a perceptively, uh, subjectively perceived, uh, uh, mutually hurting stalemate, and then that there is the possibility of negotiating oneself out. Um, we don't pay much attention to this in our analyses of negotiation and of conflicts. We're always focusing on the what, uh, isn't, isn't there a solution that uh, the parties can agree on? 
Um, is, isn't there a, how about the two-state solution? Isn't that a salient solution that would be, that would be good? Um, isn't there, oh geez, there must be some kind of solution that the parties can negotiate together uh, to get out of the Syrian uh, conflict. And we miss the entire point of getting to the what by ignoring the when. That is, the parties don't look for what. They're inter not interested in hearing what unless they find themselves locked in a mutually hurting stalemate um, and uh, with a sense that the other party uh, might be willing to, or feels the same thing and might be willing to look for a, uh, uh, a, a, an outcome at the same time. Uh, there are lots of, uh, it, uh, of illustrations from the Middle East of this situation. Um, the, uh, one of the problems uh, that's, one of the objections that's been made to the idea of ripeness is that, uh, well, uh, agreement or negotiations are a sign of ripeness, but are there times when something was ripe and not seized? Or are there times when something was seized and not ripe and therefore fell through? And the Middle East tells us all kinds of things about that. Uh, we can begin with the small. We can begin with the, uh, the uh, ceasefire uh, in, in ceasefires in the year 2000, uh, years 2000 and 2008 and 2012 between Israel and Hamas. Israel, of course, as you know, does not negotiate with Hamas. So uh, the ceasefire of 2008 was negotiated between the two parties. Nonetheless, um, uh, because of a, 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 uh, a, a stalemate in which the two parties found, found themselves, Hamas was lobbing uh, missiles into Israel, uh, and uh, uh, the IDF was, was unable to, uh, to keep them from doing that, and uh, Hamas was unable to keep the Israeli Defense Force from uh, coming in. And so they negotiated a ceasefire for a while, but th that didn't work very well, and so we had uh, uh, Operation Cast Lead um, into Gaza, uh, and uh, that broke down the ceasefire. But then uh, the same kind of situation uh, was, uh, um, uh, Operation Cast Lead, I'm sorry, led then to the 2008 ceasefire, and then again there was an, uh, that broke down. There was a new operation, this Operation Pillar of Defense was the name, and uh, which showed both sides. They, they can't stop, the Israelis can't stop the missiles. Uh, Hamas uh, uh, can't stop the Israelis. Israelis can't stop the missiles because it's not necessarily Hamas. Hamas can't stop the IDF from coming in. And uh, because uh, they can't control uh, all of the people on the missiles. And so together they had better um, uh, uh, negotiate another ceasefire. In both cases, it was with the help of the Egyptians, uh, Mubarak the first time, Morsi the second time, uh, and a new ceasefire uh, was set up in, in uh, 2012 that's now uh, still under uh, existence um, and uh, uh, although is being uh, tested, uh, it's, it's still holding so far uh, and, and uh, it, it may indeed have created then a stalemate that would, one would think it would have created a stalemate then which would lead to further negotiations, but the, the outcome, I should have mentioned this first, the mutually enticing opportunity which will pull people into further types of relationships uh, has not occurred and we have this very uh, delicate type of result of the negotiations. Um, a, a big, an even bigger example was Oslo. Uh, Oslo was uh, the result of, uh, first of all, a, a situation set up by the conference of, uh, at Madrid, and then Madrid turned into the negotiations in Washington between, uh, between uh, Palestinians, uh, Arab states, and Israel. Uh, of course, the PLO was unable to be, was not allowed to come to Washington. Uh, the, n the negotiations continued, uh, but never got out of their uh, the pro forma stage uh, and created themselves a stalemate. And uh, in this stalemate, two of the leaders, the leaders of the two sides, uh, uh, both uh, Arafat uh, and uh, Rabin, then said that there will be negotiations within a year, uh, within my time of a year and in my time of office, 
uh, and therefore created for themselves uh, 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 part two of the stalemate. Uh, I'm under pressure now, the hurting stalemate, under, under pressure within a year to bring about some kind of an, an agreement. And then uh, the greatest hurt of all, they both discovered uh, a common enemy in the existence of Hamas. So under this uh, triple aspect of a mutually hurting stalemate that they, they recognized, that is a stalemate uh, in Washington, Madrid, Madrid, Washington, a, a stalemate in regard to their own promises that they had made and then stalemate in regard to uh, Hamas that was rising in power, they negotiated together the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Oslo uh, Agreement. Um, which uh, then also did not, by the way, produce a mutually enticing opportunity because they went home and neither of them sold the agreement to their other sides and immediately set about to break it down. Uh, there are uh, other situations uh, that, are, uh, that provide negative examples where there may be some kind of a stalemate, one would think, objectively, but the stalemate is not felt and is not felt in, as hurting in comparison to what uh, might happen, uh, what might turn out if there were some kind of, of an agreement, or what might turn out if, if there were agreement that balanced into one way or a, another. Typical uh, prisoner's dilemma type of situation. Uh, one example of this is the Western Sahara, where the, uh, the, the sides are, uh, are stalemated, to be sure, uh, in, in some sense are hurting, but the Polisario is really not hurting very badly because Algeria keeps feeding it, and uh, Morocco is not hurting too badly because the Gulf states keep feeding, it, uh, feeding its, its army. Um, uh, Morocco is feeling more and more frustrated because it, provo it proposed something in the middle, a, a what, a type of a solution, but it can do nothing uh, to bring about this uh, subjectively felt hurting stalemate, and, and there we are, stuck. Uh, th this also illustrates to us another aspect of the, of the situation that in this type of situation, nobody wants to mediate. Uh, nobody's going to take on the job uh, that uh, is, can be difficult for their foreign policies uh, in mediating the situation and telling the two sides how much it hurts, trying to make it hurt for them, in, in fact, if they want, uh, and uh, bringing about negotiations. The same thing is true. Uh, negatively and positively, negatively at the present time in regard to Nagorno-Karabakh. There are two salient solutions. There's no intermediate solution, uh, not even a, an autonomy kind of thing like the Moroccans have proposed in the Western Sahara. Um, and, uh, and therefore the parties are stuck. Uh, they, are, they are hurt in some way, and yet in both cases their hurt has been removed, in the case of Azerbaijan, by the fact that it's rolling in oil, uh, and in the case of Armenia, by the fact that it sold its economy and its security to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union, they are Soviet Union, I'm sorry, remember the Soviet <laughs> Union? Uh, I'm beginning to feel it's around these days again, <laughs> to Russia. And uh, Russia uh, then has been acting as the guarantor by keeping this uh, uh, stalemate from hurting on its side has been acting as the guarantor that there will not be any kind of breakdown in the, the stalemate between the, uh, the two sides. Uh, again, there have been uh, attempts to mediate here, but nobody's doing it very actively. Uh, the Minsk group, which has Russia on it, is, has been rather inactive. However, the Minsk group at one time, back in 94, was active, uh, and particularly Russia, when the two sides in Nagorno-Karabakh, right after, after a couple of years of war, found themselves in a mutually hurting stalemate. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan had not gotten into its oil as yet. The, each side had, had uh, extended about as far as it could, and so they negotiated, uh, negotiated a ceasefire, uh, which has held uh, since then, from 1994 for 20 years, uh, since the situation at that point was ripe and has held on. But again, as I pointed out in other cases, uh, it has not been able to be turned into a mutually enticing opportunity in a what that would pull the parties out of that simply dampened uh, conflict. Uh, another case uh, that's uh, illustrative is the case of Afghanistan. Uh, negotiations have been uh, mooted between various parties uh, in uh, Afghanistan, the UN, the US, 
the uh, alliance, the Taliban, the government of Afghanistan, um, and uh, in no case has anybody felt themselves to be in a mutually hurting stalemate. And this aspect brings out that, that mutual, that bilateral side. Um, all parties, all of them, have been negotiating uh, with each other. Uh, it's not a question of whether you're going to try to, to whether you're going to try talks, as, the, as our speaker to, to, told us at lunchtime. But it, talks have been tried, but they haven't gotten anywhere beyond that, that opening. Um, and uh, the question is here, uh, what kind of exchanges uh, can take place? Uh, what kind of mutuality exists in the, in the stalemate? The United States, uh, uh, the United Nations has been negotiating, but it's, it's uh, hard to see on the behalf of whom. Uh, it is uh, negotiating. It is not able to deliver, and it is therefore not able to contribute to the sense of the, the stalemate. The United States has been negotiating with the Taliban on and off a little bit, uh, gently, and the United States is in the position of saying, look, um, if, if you uh, agree and start to go to negotiating with me, I, I'll uh, remove the conditions which Taliban uh, uh, spokesmen have spo uh, expressed from time to time, the condition of stalemate by leaving. And if you don't negotiate with me, I will remove the conditions of stalemate by leaving. <laughs> well, that doesn't give you much leverage. And uh, in, in fact, it, uh, it uh, impels the, the Taliban to say, well, let's just hold it out. Let's make some symbols about negotiating so that we look good internationally. But uh, what are you offering me? What's the deal? Um, and then the United States says, well, we'll leave a little more gradually. And then Karzai says, you'll leave completely, and he will negotiate in turn with the Taliban, but again, with very little leverage on either side. The situation is simply uh, not in a mutually hurting stalemate there, although there have been occasion expressions in the past, and I think these are just worth ticking off because they're, they're symbolic of or illustrative of what we're looking for. Uh, uh, let's see, a, a, a diplomat in, the, in Afghanistan. The Taliban said back in 2008, the Taliban are des um, the diplomat said, the Taliban are desperate to take part in the process. They have had seven years of suffering losses on the battlefield and know that it is not sustainable. That was the time when we were closer to a stalemate in 2008 than we are now. Uh, a former Taliban ambassador said, America cannot win this war and the Taliban cannot win this war. I have delivered this message to the Taliban, but he was a former Taliban ambassador. That was in 2009. Local leaders in particular say it's time, local leaders, it's time to start talking as they are fed up with the war that has caught civilians in the middle. Both sides are tired of fighting and bombing each other and look to relieve the civilians who are the victims, said a Pushtun tribal elder in 2013. But none of these are, uh, these are expressions of observers in the outside, but not of people who would do the negotiating, and in no case has this uh, brought us to a uh, mutually hurting stalemate. Um, what's going on today? Uh, today we have, uh, serious, have had serious efforts to bring the parties together in uh, Geneva to uh, discuss the possibility of some kind of an agreement, uh, either to uh, keep down the fighting, uh, or at least to bring some, uh, some uh, relief to the people who are, are the biggest victims of the, party, of the fighting, that is, who are feeling the hurt, um, and perhaps the stalemate as well, and that's the, the poor Syrian people. Um, and they have been mediated. Uh, we've been working real hard uh, on trying to get the parties to come to uh, a negotiation. But in the process, over the last two years, we've seen that one party is forging steadily ahead and the other party is forging steadily behind. Uh, it, and uh, uh, therefore, there is an imbalance and there is obvious evidence that one of the parties, uh, the Assad government, feels itself not to be in a stalemate at all, thank you. Uh, it has been supported more and more by its outside, uh, uh, its outside supporters, by uh, Iran uh, and by Russia, and it keeps on uh, moving ahead in destroying its population and uh, destroying some of the elements of the, of the opposition. Uh, the opposition has been pulling back. 
uh, fighting real hard uh, and uh, in its diversity uh, trying to put up a, a fight, but uh, it is in a weaker and weaker uh, position. Um, the opposition uh, gets some uh, support uh, uh, from the, the Gulfies, uh, and that gives them some uh, arms, but uh, major support from the outside, and particularly from the, the West, which had a dog in the fight called the Free Syrian Army, uh, has been completely lacking. Um, I, I was called into the policy planning staff uh, uh, back in 2012, uh, after the Battle of Qusair, where the which was one of the first big battles that the uh, Assad forces took over, and I, I said, uh, sure, go ahead with uh, holding a Geneva meetings. Uh, I don't think anything will come of it. I was right, unfortunately. And uh, you, you shouldn't uh, hold meetings until the Free Syrian Army has, has had a Qusair of its own. And I was told, uh, and I quote, certainly, I should not count on anything like that happening. So uh, we want negotiate. We wanted negotiations, but we will. We did nothing to create the precondition of negotiation opening up. That is the uh, 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 helping out, uh, creating a, a mutually hurting stalemate. We are now uh, doing a little bit more. Um, we uh, blackmailed the Free Syrian Army uh, I into attending the. Uh, the Geneva uh, conference by saying that if, if you don't attend the conference, we won't give you any aid. And since we didn't give us any aid, give them any aid of significance, any military aid before that, that was not a terribly comp compelling argument. Uh, and, and we said we will not, and we won't give you uh, any aid afterwards. So under the promise of some aid afterward, uh, they came in, lest they lose any legitimacy of their position. Uh, and uh, now we're giving them a little bit, much too little, much too late. The, it, if we just didn't want to aid them, that would be one thing. But with one hand, we made it a major plank of the policy. It was our invention to hold Geneva II under conditions in which it was guaranteed that there would be uh, no outcome. What is shocking is not just that we're doing that, that we did that, but uh, that we didn't realize in going in there that we weren't providing the preconditions of the success uh, of our policy. Do not count, certainly not count on anything like that happening. We're also pressing uh, for negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians, um, and uh, uh, the Secretary of State has been working real hard on the what. Um, the what is, uh, has risen, uh, caused cries to come from both sides. Any kind of intermediate solution is going to do that. Um, and there is lots of laudable effort going into that. Uh, as far as any evidence shows, and uh, not all is public in this world, as far as any evidence shows, we are not working on the when. We are working on the mutually enticing opportunity. Look how like, good life will be when you get out of this conflict. But why should we get out of this conflict now? Both sides have done an extraordinary job of internalizing uh, the conflict, the stalemate in which they find themselves, into their own national myths. No gain without pain. Uh, it's a good fight, but it's, and it's worth it. Uh, tomorrow in Jerusalem, say both sides, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, today is not hurting enough to get us there. If we want this to succeed, we have to do something to ripen the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Professor Sartman? situation, it seems to me, in, in Egypt uh, prior to Morsi's election. Um, 
or an opportunity just after that. Uh, they had for a year or so a kind of a seesaw type of government in which each one made a, a, con a little concession and then the other side made a little concession and then they had some demonstrations and pressure on either side. Very much of a, a productive stalemate. But the trouble with a seesaw is, as you know from your childhood days on a seesaw, is that there's always a temptation to jump off and let the other guy go flying up in, into the air. In other words, to, to jump from that uh, 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 delicate balance into a, a victory. Uh, and uh, that's what the military did, uh, and then Morsi did back. Uh, then he got elected and he said, now I've got it. Uh, and so he uh, refused to do any negotiating uh, and uh, uh, refused to ex expand his uh, uh, his contacts uh, within the Egyptian political scene and, and handle the military. And so the military said, I have a bigger Trump than you do. Uh, and it, it kicked him out. Um, had that situation been really stuck, rather than being able to outbid each other in, a, in an outbidding game, then we could have been at something uh, that operated for the first year or so. Um, where has there been a mutually hurting stalemate among the sides? Well, an, an interesting case, which is messy, very messy, but still, might be Yemen, uh, where they finally got Saleh out, but uh, he's only partly out. His big feet are still in, uh, and, and uh, now they're trying to work a little more in a more expansive type of, of system. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'd have to think of some other cases, but it's certainly, in short, yes, it's possible internally uh, as well as, as more internationally. In fact, many of these examples are kind of with rebellions. Yeah? I have a question. You mentioned Syria. You raised Syria and the situation there. And I'd like to ask you about the unlikely Russian brokered deal over the removal of chemical weapons from Syria. Unlikely because of the way it came about. It seemed very, very odd to mm -hmm. many people. So there are winners and losers, I guess. Before that, the United States, I guess, was in some uh, trouble. At least the president maybe was in some political trouble over that. Mm -hmm. The Assad regime certainly probably felt threatened by United States direct intervention or indirect. Maybe direct, mm -hmm. I should say. Um, so who are the winners and losers in that? It seemed like a deal that it, it maybe helped some or hurt some, and maybe it helped and hurt some at the same time. Yeah, well, I'm not talking about winners and losers, which is something subsequent to this. But your example is a good example of, of the ripeness argument, uh, although I'm not sure whether it was intentional or not. Uh, the, the Syrians were, we let drop this idea of membership in the, uh, in the chemical weapons organization. Uh, and negotiations were started, and uh, the, the threat was out there. Uh, to uh, proceed to military action. Uh, now, uh, it turned out that the president wasn't going to lead it and wasn't, uh, found it too risky and so on, so how real was that threat, we don't know. But the Syrians don't know either, and, and people, <laughs> as, our, as our speaker at lunchtime tell us, people like to uh, usually think of their enemies as operating as they would operate. And so they think we're uh, double-faced about it and there's a single system in the United States and it was all programmed. That's true, that, that's what they thought. Uh, programmed by the, uh, by the executive. Um, and it may well have been by that threat, mutually hurting stalemate, threat forced into uh, an agreement. Who won and, to, and who lost? Well, Russia won. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, we showed that uh, if you break the, the regime, the, the norm, you won't be punished. Uh, so I, uh, that's another outcome. Uh, and then we'll just have to see whether they go through with this agreement. Because the Syrian, the Assad government has been party to many, many agreements that they haven't gone through with. Agreement is one thing. Going through with it is another, and they are, as of now, way behind schedule. Uh, we may forget it as the conflict goes on. Thank you. The mutually hurting stalemate, lesson of the sermon is, the mutually hurting stalemate is, does not guarantee results. Guarantees the beginning. It creates a necessary but not sufficient condition for the opening of negotiations, and from then you've got to keep on going. Yeah. When you were speaking about mutually hurting stalemate, 
I was thinking about the Israel-Palestine situation, mm -hmm. and it seemed to me that <clears throat> Israel is very concerned <coughs> about, you know, any any talk about identifying Israel as operating an apartheid system or you know boycotting products that are made in the mm -hmm. West Bank. Uh, yeah. So it seemed to me that that could be a sort of public pressure that would move, be moving them towards the uh, mutually hurting stalemate. Well, that's what the people uh, thought maybe uh, who were talking at, at lunchtime about the, the boycott. Um, and if we do enough of this, uh, maybe it'll be so. Uh, as I said, both sides have incorporated this idea of a stalemate into their national myths. Um, and uh, for the moment, if you look at the uh, advertisement about Israel, you come to Israel, there's no danger. Right. It's just like being at home. <laughs> the sunshine is there. We got good beaches. Yeah. All those dangerous and dirty people on the other side of the of the green line are, are on the other side of the green line. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a sign of hurt. Right. If it needs a lot more to bring home that idea of hurt. Palestinians are hurting, but they're they're used to hurting. So uh, uh, that uh, and what's the point of of admitting it? And so we just hang on until we have enough children that will uh, swallow them all up. So th th we are a long way from uh, a mutually hurting stalemate, and the, yet the idea of the mutually hurting stalemate tells us what we should be focusing on if we're going to create a negotiable type of situation. Yeah, yeah. So if you were uh, an advisor to Secretary Kerry, and he wanted your help in helping to ripen the situation um, and move between Israel and Palestine and move away from this mutually enticing opportunities, what steps would you specifically suggest towards helping to ripen it? I wish, I wish you'd asked me about Syria because I, <laughs> it, it's much clearer to me what, what should have been done. As, and I said it at the time and I continue to say it with less and less hope about it. Um, it's very tough in Israel-Palestine at the, at the present time. And I think one, one has to, uh, to work on a number of angles. Uh, one has to work on strengthening J Street. One has to work on, a, um, a, a, as the most visible thing that Curry did in this regard was to talk about the, uh, what are you talking about, the reputation of Israel, its pariah uh, a situation. Uh, point out that if, if the monkey is on its back, as the, the diplomatic phrase goes, that, that it, it can't look for increased sympathy uh, from the world. Um, uh, one would have to work, uh, as I said at, uh, at the noontime session, one would have to work on a, a American public pressure, and hence the J Street business as well, on, uh, on American policy that would, uh, uh, that would slow down, certainly not stop, because we've got a commitment to, to Israel very strongly that I, that I believe in, but slow down, uh, threaten and so on, some of this, uh, the, the massive aid that's being given, you know. 5% reduction would send tremors. Um, we have at three times earlier uh, threatened, pressured Israel into some kind of movement that we now continue, uh, count as part of history. Uh, under uh, Eisenhower with the, under Eisenhower with the, uh, was Eisenhower there then? In any case, the, uh, the Suez Canal uh, incident. Um, uh, the uh, Madrid, where we threatened, uh, where we held up loan guarantees in, in order to bring uh, uh, Israel, uh, not to bring them to negotiation, but just to bring them to the Madrid conference. And once they were there, then they were trapped. And then they went on to, uh, to Washington. And then that chain of events, you know, it's not one big boom, but it's a chain of events then that set up uh, Oslo. Uh, on 9-11, I was chairing a meeting uh, over at SAIS in which Dennis Ross was talking. And he was saying, our great failure in Oslo was we didn't do what we had committed to do of pushing both sides to sell that agreement at home. Uh, and then uh, the television showed us that we were being bombed. Uh, a very memorable morning. Uh, so there are, there are things of that kind, but, but when the situation then has gone so far as, uh, as uh, a Netanyahu, uh, one has to get into his calculation 
about whether, about how much he wants to pay to go down as the man who was able to end the, end the conflict. And it gets costlier and costlier as the settlements keep on going on. So they're, they're, I'd be a fool if I were to give you an easy answer. Do you see any hope or any, oh, sorry. We have time for one more question. I guess that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any hope or, or, uh, for the Korean Peninsula? Is there any situation you would see where there could be a mutually hurting stalemate there? I don't think there's anywhere like th that place in the entire planet. Uh, in, in the short run, no. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think here we're dealing with a, uh, let me uh, set up with one previous sentence. The mutually hurting stalemate is subjective, and therefore it depends on the, the, the psychology, the subjectivity of the, of the leaders, hence the, the, the Netanyahu problem. And in this case, uh, one is dealing with somebody who is, uh, is so convinced of the situation in which he finds himself uh, and his need to do measures to uh, make sure that the other side is going to treat him like he thinks he's, the other side is treating him. Uh, and on and on we go into this security dilemma that's, that's in, his, in his psyche. Can he break out of that? Uh, I'm not enough a political psychologist to, to know, but it, that, that becomes extremely difficult. And what you do, I, th I think two things you do, you, you maintain the stalemate. That's the first condition. Make, try, try to make sure that they don't go any further. And, <coughs> and if they do take a step further, uh, punish or block or something like that. And then work on people who talk their language, like the Chinese, uh, to get them to think, don't you see what uh, the mess that you're, you're getting yourselves in? I mean, Juche is making the whole population poorer and poorer and more and more isolated uh, in the world. And, and you're, you're cutting off your whole face to spite your face. Uh, and then finally, uh, it, one has, there is this notion of the way out. Uh, there is this notion uh, that uh, there must be a feeling that the other side will give you something if you're going to start talking. And so uh, as the, the dilemma we're facing in regard to Iran now at the present time, uh, as our luncheon speaker was talking about, we've got to get hooked from our one-sided uh, perception of the other side and say, if, okay, if you move, we will reward you uh, and come to some kind of an agreement. Our uh, next presentation is from uh, Dr. Scott Catino, uh, A Sectarian Spring, The Continuing Struggles in Bahrain. It's all yours. You have the computer all set? Uh, I think so. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Catino, and I first of all want to thank the Policy Studies Organization and American Public University and other sponsors for this event and for American Military University for the opportunity to speak today. I think this subject is extraordinary that we're talking about, Bahrain. Um, I, I had the chance as a U.S. Fulbright Scholar from 2007 to 2009 to serve in Bahrain and live among the Bahrainis and observe the situation. Prior to that, I was a, a professor at the University of South Carolina uh, system. After that, I served with the US military in Iraq, two tours in Afghanistan, uh, currently serving as an adjunct professor at American Military University, in addition to my full-time job, specializing in insurgencies, military studies, and studying these kinds of movements to look at. But one story in particular is something that I will never forget while living in Bahrain. I had a chance as part of my Fulbright duties to not only do research, but also to teach at the University of Bahrain and get to know a lot of the young people. I remember during one seminar, and they were small size, maybe about a half a dozen to a dozen, but we had a, a very lively discussion going on, talking about American political reform, and the subject of reform came and then the subject of reform in Bahrain. 
I was very impressed at the level of openness, the level of discussion, the level of intensity, the lively exchanges going on, what I deem to be very sincere dialogue, very rich in ideas, and the fact that both Sunni and Shia, on very opposite sides of the question, were talking openly. I remember walking out after that hour seminar and talking to a young man that I got to know while, while serving over there. He was a Sunni individual, and as we were walking out, which we often did, and just chatted, I said to that young man, I said, how wonderful is this? That we had a chance to talk about these very, very contentious issues, issues that are very, very divisive, and yet we all sit down, we talk civilly together about these issues. And he said to me, Dr. Catino, I assure you that after these seminars are over, a very different discussion goes on that is not so civil. Kind of caught me. I looked at him and he said, Bahrain is ready to rip apart at the seams. That was in 2009. I frankly thought, no, okay, thank you for sharing that. Walked away, didn't say it, but in my mind I thought, he's a young guy, come on, he's 19. A little too much testosterone, playing a little too much soccer. It can't be that bad. It was that bad, and I was wrong. And beneath that society that seemed so peaceful and so civilized, I gotta move this, <laughs> was a very intense sectarian divide. And we as scholars often miss that, because we like our theories. We like all sorts of grandiose, the rentier theory. You know how you want to learn about Bahrain? Go look at some of the blogs and see the level of tension. Now, I know it's been heightened after this type of crisis, but it was there before that. There is very deep, very intense, and often very violent language that's going on. Well, Doc, aren't you just so optimistic here this afternoon? Well, I want to be honest about it. And I, I know there's a risk whenever you reveal your research, it starts to support one side or another, some people think, or it looks sectarian. That's, that's not my purpose. Before I even get into this, I want to say my purpose is to be explanatory in my research, to look at an event and just explain it. What the cure for this is, I'll leave that up to you. What the best way to approach this politically, ethically, economically, diplomatically, with information, I'll leave that up to individuals who specialize. All I want to do in the, is to be able to analyze this with the military skills that I've used and intelligence analysis for this matter. Quick disclaimer, I think it's important to state that this is particularly my view and no other view of any organization I'm associated with. But I want to call attention to something. My methodology is unique. I've read, as many of you have, a lot about Bahrain. And we're going into a military situation. We don't want to call it that. I will. This is an insurgency that took place. It is a very skilled, tactically sophisticated, logical lines of operation, phased operation, and led from the ground insurgency, an urban insurgency that took place. The tactics are very skilled. The people that are using these are masters at covering them. So if you think you're simply going to, and I say this respectfully, simply pick up a newspaper article and try to understand this through all the intentional deception that's going on, it's just not going to take place. And I think that we as people who study military science need to have a say in this. I think our methodology needs to be applied to these situations. And again, I say that humbly. We have something to say. We have skills to be applied. And many of us who have served multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, the multitude of people coming back have analytical skills to share and to participate in to help discuss some of these. Well, I think our understanding of Bahrain probably varies in this crowd, but just some, some quick, more overarching type themes to understand as we go into this topic should be stated up front. Well, there was a Shia uprising. We understand that. It was very large. It swept across this small island that's 15 miles by 35 miles. We read about that. Many people look back, kind of lost that picture in amid the other Arab Springs taking place. But a key point to understand is the Al Khalifa monarchy, the Sunni monarchy, almost fell. It came within a thread 
of being overthrown. And had that intervention of the Gulf Security Forces, the Peninsula Shield Forces spearheaded by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, had that not taken place, that government would have been overthrown. It was simply that close. I could say that confidently without exaggeration. So that's what we're talking about. Secondly, the root causes of this, widely reported both in journalistic and in scholarly circles, that socioeconomic causes are the root of the Shia unrest, that it's simply an issue of people that are marginalized socially and economically. Well, there's certainly that, but we, we have that where I grew up in the area. The Philadelphia area, there are a lot of people that are marginalized. I don't see an insurgency taking place there. So there's something more to it, and I want to call attention to that because I'm going to take exception to that theory of simply explaining this away as a socioeconomic issue. I don't believe it's that. Well, it's that, of course, and something much more. And the strategic interests we have to understand, some people have read a bit about this, but this is very, very important to the United States. It is very much an American issue. It's not enough just to say our fifth fleet is there. This issue is tied not only to oil security, it is intimately tied to the Sunni-Shia balance, to our relationship with Iran, and ties into wider Middle East issues too. Our influence in the region, and even something like the Arab-Israeli conflict, is tied to our presence in this area. And despite what some people say, that the U.S. can simply retreat and take its base out of there and fall back to Qatar or the UAE, it's not that simple. That's a subject by itself, but it is of extraordinary strategic importance and should be seen in that, that space. Okay, what's my thesis? What's the point I want to say here? An extraordinary individual who was a scholar for U.S. Special Forces in the 1960s drew attention to something that had gone on in the 60s, something called crowd manipulation strategy. Uh, um, Andrew Molnar was his name. My thesis is that in 2011, a crowd manip manipulation strategy had taken place. This was not a democratic, peaceful, and spontaneous protest. I know that's sharp, but I want to be, I want to be fair about that. That is not to say that there, were, there weren't many sincere Shia who had absolutely no desire to get involved in violence. There were certainly many of those. How many? Who knows? Who did it count? I don't want to try to portray the entire Shia population as being a violent group of individuals that just had a bloodlust. That's not the case, and to overstate it like that would be grossly misunderstanding what I'm trying to say, but individuals like Bolner and people who study urban insurgency say that's the exact fact that makes these crowd manipulation strategies so dangerous because the people at top who are pulling the strings and organizing and directing these type of crowds know the individuals, many of them are very sincere. But inside, there are tactically embedded combat terrorist units that are carrying out violent acts. The crowds are being moved in logical lines of operation on strategic, strategic targets. We'll talk about that in a second. It's not spontaneous, it's not democratic, and it is certainly not violent. It's certainly non-peaceful. It is violent to its core. So we have to understand that if we're ever going to address this, if we're ever going to be able to focus on this, if we as Americans are, are able to address this, from a humanitarian standpoint or a security standpoint, we got to see it for what it is. That's the starting point. 2012 to the present, there was a tactical shift that took place. That is a, a specific, unique development that, given the fact that the government of Bahrain was able to reestablish security and check this crowd behavior, the Shia leadership the opposition moved to a low intensity, prolonged violence strategy using small unit and swarming tactics to stabilize Bahrain and gain political concessions. That's my second major point. Okay. So when you see something like this where there are crowds moving and there's just many acts of violence, it all seems so chaotic. It seems like there's absolutely no rhyme or reason to all of this. It seems like one explosive event or another. The information is conflicted. We call this in the intelligence noise. There's so much noise, it's difficult to understand what is substance, where is fire, and where is smoke. 
But if you step back for a second, you will see that there are certainly patterns of behavior taking place here that show an order of what's going on. For instance, some of the most visible were logical lines of operation or lines of operations taking place. When the crowds began to move, they were moving on specific lines of behavior toward specific targets, striking at the security forces, thinning them, degrading them, and causing them to collapse. That was the first thing that took place. These were not random or spontaneous. They were striking at security forces across the island, both thinning and degrading them, arson attacks. And this is something that we should understand. It makes absolutely no difference if an individual uses an AK-47 or a Molotov cocktail. The effects are the same. If a person takes an AK-47 and shoots and sprays an area, that's horrible. It may kill no one. But if a person uses a Molotov cocktail, you know what I'm talking about. So it's a very simple, crude uh, bottle filled with gasoline, dipped in some sort of flammable substance and used and lit. That could be absolutely more damaging than if somebody set off a sophisticated IED. It can burn down entire blocks, and that was taking place. These fires were starting every arson attack. Police were being attacked in various parts of the island. Ah, that tells me as someone who studies this, that wait a minute, it's happening in diverse parts of the island. The, f the security forces are beginning to thin and spread. That's exactly what an urban insurgent tries to do. A second line of operation that's taking place. While all this chaos is taking place, all these fights are taking place, the leadership is intentionally agitating, saying that the government is completely violent. There are acts of provocation taking place, inciting the crowd, inciting the crowd to further violence, further action against the police force. The leadership of the opposition, the Al Wafak party, stood up and said, the government is no longer legitimate. Note the strike on the political force. It's time to set up another government, an interim government, and thereby totally delegitimize the government and overthrow it. Again, these, these, these events are taking place. Pearl Roundabout. People see the Pearl Roundabout and look at that. Major event. Protesters are taking place. The media says this is a very democratic protest that's taking place. One of the most unbiased reports that both sides admit is this Bickey report, the Bahrain Independent Commission report, is taking place. And as it's doing this, it notices that there are Tactical, low-intensity combat units armed with crude weapons that are inside those mass demonstrations taking place used to provoke the police to violence. This is very common in an urban insurgency, certainly not the first time this has ever taken place. Andrew Molner and people who study in urban insurgency are very careful to bring this out. It's happened many times. It's happened all over Latin America. These are tactics that Hezbollah used. It happened in Lebanon recently. We saw this in Iraq and Afghanistan. This type of behavior is very common. So what happened, the opposition was able to call this peaceful and democratic. And as these crowds are moving, they're moving towards specific objectives. They're striking at security. They're moving on the financial center, which comes later. They're blocking roads. The police are being uh, attacked. And these specialized units inside, very well trained with weapons, are again attacking and, and causing more, more problems. This happened quite a bit. Um, you know, second thing here, politically, we look at this, this was an interesting case here too, the Samania Medical Complex. You know, again, the media just reports all these masses of people moving on this medical complex. What happened inside was very interesting, that the administration of that hospital was in essence overthrown, that there were people planted inside there that simply threw out the leadership administrative and began to take over, and as a result of that, this hospital center becomes a center now for staging protests, for not just launching them, retreating from a protest. And what's extremely important in this type of urban insurgency is to create a high visibility. It's like in Tiananmen Square. You want to create a location where the media is able to address you and understand your views and hear your views, and then by doing so, you get your message out. So this became a central location for messaging. Not surprisingly, they found there were weapons were found at that location also. So caching weapons, storing weapons, uh, once again, found in this area. Same thing here, too. We see, this is, this is very typical. I saw, this, I saw this in Iraq and Afghanistan quite a bit. 
mosques were used. Mosques were used for, used for planning attacks, storing weapons, staging attacks, and obviously for strong retreat lines. You know, once you strike out at a police force, they're going to come after you. But if you're in a mosque and the security forces try to arrest you or detain you, you have a very strong political social cover. And that is to say that they are infringing upon this holy sacred area. They are violating our religion. And the effects of that, and this is important, this is exactly how a military commander would look at this. And this is exactly how an urban insurgent is able to look at this. They're able to step back and say, okay, even if they capture a few of us or this mosque, what's the fallout going to be? What's the fallout going to be if the government security forces strike into an area like that and come into that mosque? The political fallout, the information and the propaganda that's able to be generated from that type of move of the government creates effects that are very, very strong and that accrue to the opposition. So this is the kind of street tactics that were taking place in Iran. Now, I, I also want to be very balanced in this, this perspective. You know, I talked about this issue quite a bit. And people will say, what about the government? What about the government's overreaction? And that did take place. I mean, I, I would be completely biased if I didn't acknowledge that. Again, we're getting back to that social level of conflict that's so deep in Bahrain, that intense level of passion and an intense level of, of hatred. Again, just take a look at some of the social media and see the calls for death for the opposite side. So when this type of agitation and provocation is taking place, and the outside world is looking at this, really not sure what it is, well, scratching her head, oh, it's like Tiananmen Square, it's like the Arab Spring, it's like Egypt all over again. No, this hatred, this broiling hatred that's so embedded in society is just unleashed. So what happens is we see it degenerating not just from the tactical level, it goes down to the ground level where you start to see actually riots and Sunni and Shia fighting each other in the villages. The government starts to unravel. The police can't handle all of this. They can't put out a fire here, a fire there, a fire over there. They can't do it. It stretches their forces very thin. And the government, and this is the, the exact effect a very calculated insurgent wants, the government begins to lose, a, lose legitimacy with, with whom? With, with the Shia, they've already lost that legitimacy. The government begins to lose the legitimacy with its very own supporters, the Sunni. And that's what began to happen. The average person in the street is saying, I have absolutely no protection. If you're on the Shia side, you're saying, yeah, because the government is so corrupt. Look what they've done. If you're on the Sunni side, you're saying our government's what? It's weak. It's ineffective. And you start to look for alternatives. And that's the exact kind of outcome that brings a government down. And that's the kind of situation that was taking place. And this last move, and I, I mean this just from a tactical perspective, was brilliant in its, in its design and in its execution. The leader of al-Wafaq, the Shia opposition, the main opposition, calls a strike in essence, no, that's not the right word, tells the crowd, he brings up the issue, Ali Solomon, that the al-Khalifa prime minister had bought major... Uh, land ownings in the financial district and business for one dinar. The point was that, what is a dinar worth? Like $3.60 or something like that. The point was to expose corruption and to call attention to corruption. And again, it whips the crowd up. All right, they got angry at that. But again, the people in charge of the opposition start to mobilize these crowds. They're coming out in the street. The average Shia is furious at this. This knowledge comes out, this secret knowledge. Happens to fall into the hands of the opposition. Do the crowds just get up and start yelling? No. They're directed to go where? Logical line of operation, right at the financial center. It doesn't take a genius to tell you what happens if you shut down the financial center of a country like that. The financial harbor, what happens? There's nothing left to the viability of that state. There's nothing left to it. So that's exactly at the point. This is bad enough. The government is ready to be overthrown. And when that takes place in the middle of March, when these protesters begin to move, I'm sparing you the details on how they move. There's a lot of tactical sophistication in there. It's kind of beyond what needs to be said at this moment. Um, and they're beginning to choke off that financial uh, harbor there. That's the point where the government said it's time to bring in the peninsula force and bring it in. So at this point, it becomes an effective counterterrorism, counterinsurgency operation that the 
uh, government of Bahrain undertakes, and they, they're able to do this with extraordinary skill and finesse. What happens is when the Peninsula Shield Force comes in, it's, 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 just, it's just very, very uh, skilled in the way it's conducted. The United Arab Emirates police helping the Bahraini police, but it, in essence, the strategy was for the Peninsula Shield to secure static areas on the island, static infrastructure electricity, the airports, the major government centers that were being attacked, that were being threatened to being burned down, where martyr operations are moving against these buildings. There was a, an attempt of a group to kill. We're going to kill one of the officials, they said, or even they moved on the palace of the, of the king. So the security forces of the Peninsula Shields take care of all that static security, and that frees up the Bahraini security forces, which is upgraded to a military level and also its police force begin to move, they can move specifically on these crowds and as a result of that they're able to in some create a position of security. Simultaneously the information operations of the opposition fail horribly. They tried to betray this as, as a democratic uprising. They needed to gain mass. They needed to get support on the island, support in the global media. They didn't. They got a lot a lot of human rights groups, but not enough. You know, human rights people are jumping in saying this is terrible. It was terrible. Of course it's terrible. It was, it was a horrible fight that was going on. And there are crimes committed both sides. Depth, who are they going to? You need to get the key policymakers. You need to get who? President of the United States. You need to have individuals in the UN. You need to have some real power brokers to step up and make some big statements. Didn't happen. Don't get me wrong, the fact that the United States kind of played this, well, we're not happy, it's too repressive, all right, you know, we, we all wish it was done better. We'd like to see more democracy. So, okay, we kind of played it in the middle. That got both sides angry. But it still didn't allow the success to take place, et cetera, et cetera. Failure. Successful counterterrorism operations. The Shia opposition is now geographically isolated, politically isolated. They can't really move around. Sure, they can have some mass protests. They even did recently, but not as many, not with the freedom of movement, certainly not striking those key targets. So what they have to do now, what are they doing? They're worried about a movement. Ah, this is so critical for an urban insurgency. You can't let your movement die. You can't. Every terrorist organization, every violent movement, every insurgency faces something far worse than death in their eyes. They fear becoming irrelevant. You can't do that. So extraordinarily, Ayatollah Issa Qasim, well, he's not the official leader of al-Wafaq, he's certainly a major leader, and his authority is, is uh, supreme in many respects, stands up and calls for a crushing of the Bahrain security forces for insulting Shia girls and women. It was a major tactical shift, an open calling. And I had this video queued up, but I think it's going to be, I don't think we're online, I can't show it. But it was a major tactical shift that took place, calling, openly calling. That's supposed to be the moderate middle of Bahrain's opposition, calling for open attacks on the security forces. And there are all kinds of people that kind of debate that. Did he really mean this? Did he really mean it? Well, his, the, the people that were in the audience were screaming, we are your martyrs, oh Hussein. The next day they went out and they, they attacked many police and killed, killed individuals. People died because of that statement. And as a result of that, we see a major tactical shift. And this is very common when an organization loses power. It has to decentralize, it has to retract, and it has to result, or rather it has to undertake these small unit type terror attacks. This is important to understand if we're going to be able to diagnose this issue. Because if we don't understand this, we go into this, well, we kind of call this a protest. Well, what's going on? See, if we don't acknowledge this, we don't get anywhere. Yeah, I, I know it's not an easy, it's not easy to swallow this. I know it goes better if I can give a, a hopeful message and say, oh, there's, there's progress taking place. We like to hear that. We're so optimistic as Americans. But this is a painful reality that's, that's taking place in Bahrain. So you have these villages where these small unit type terrorist groups, particularly these, these young, are incited to attack. And this is happening on a daily basis, to attack police vehicles, to burn, and to uh, attack police stations. It's happening quite a bit. And in the middle of that, there's also some advanced terrorist type weaponry that's coming in, and this, the use of IEDs, crude IEDs. 
and the capabilities are starting to escalate. That's kind of a third trend, but there's some beginning evidence of that. But before I make that a concrete statement, I want to do more research on that. So that's taking place. So, you know, people are looking at this, scratching their head, not, to know, not really know what's going on. But you know what? If we study our history, this looks pretty familiar. Wait a minute. This happened in the 1990s. Same patterns, same use of violence, same types of attacks, same type of targeting critical infrastructure. Happened in the 90s, happened in the 80s. Some of the same people involved. So we need historical depth when we look at this issue. What are my conclusions? All right. Again, I, I'm trying to be diagnostic about this. We want to look at just what is happening. All right? You have your ideas of why it's happening. Those are, those are good. We can talk about that. The failure of the Shia opposition to achieve regime change has caused it to shift tactics away from mass crowd manipulation and instead rely on small unit terrorist attacks. That's, that's what has happened. That's not to say they can't have mass rallies. They do. And some of the largest ones have actually happened post-2011. So what happens? They rise up and then they go down. They're not able to do anything with them. They can't move them anywhere because the security now is very strong and very effective. That's not to say the security doesn't commit any type of human rights violations. But again, I want to keep this in context. You know, the, the king of Bahrain says there's room for reform and reform should take place and there are problems. Sure. Ours wouldn't do. Ours, our own security could certainly make the same types of mistake. We, we have that same issue in the United States where there are cases of overreaction to force. Of course there are. There are in every kind of conflict. The tactical shift, this is a, a concern. The tactical shift portents a return to the Shia opposition strategy of the 90s when it used high profile and persistent terrorist activities over a long period of time to achieve major concessions from the government. This is a reversion to what happened in the 1990s. That's a concern. It's not a, a very positive trend again to look at this and see the way these forces are entrenched and the, the standoff with the government. It is a huge sectarian divide and a reversion back rather than a reversion forward. And short of a major political concession or a deeper counterterrorism operations dismantling the opposition's organizational structures, the low intensity of terrorism is likely to continue in Bahrain and threaten to destabilize it in the region, or even worse, the level of sophistication may increase. Uh, just as we saw recently in December, a, a major, uh, well, certainly an arms shipment uh, from Iran was detected, interdicted would be the right word, coming from Iran onto the island. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kutino, uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Nada Rwadi, and I'm a journalist from Bahrain. Okay. I have to admit that uh, uh, listening to your presentation was very painful to me. But anyways, I'm going to try to... I just have a few comments Please do. I want to say. Uh, not to comment on the different issues, but some stuff that were missing. Basically, okay. the political context. Why is this happening in Bahrain? This was missing from the discussion. I think this is a very important discussion to, to mention. You mentioned that this, these things happened in Bahrain in the 90s and the 80s and even uh, historically before. And there were reasons for that. And I believe uh, the situation in Bahrain, even though the sectarian conflict does exist, and I agree with you completely, but the sectarian conflict is a symptom to the main disease. And the disease is political. The disease is basically that power is not shared, that there is discrimination, there are other issues, political issues that basically resulted in people going on the streets and risking their lives and being killed actually for this over and over and over again in the 80s and in the 90s and in what happened in 2011. And uh, this is exactly the same uh, story in many of the places that uh, you know we, we have seen the Arab Spring or whatever uh, we, we call it. Uh, you mentioned like this theory about oh my God there is an organization and the insurgency and all of that. This is called civil resistance by the by the way. And there's there are all theories about how to attack you know the strength in in, in a regime if you have to change that. And uh, if you want to change or kind of defend yourself, you need to organize yourself and you need to attack. Know that I am. I'm also an observer and I was observing all these different uh, uh, actions. 
Um, what I was in Bahrain actually in 2011, I was in Pergam I, I actually, I was a reporter for USA Today, so I was the main correspondent there. I have seen it firsthand, I went to the hospital, I met with those people. Uh, so this is why it was very painful to see your analysis, okay. because I have seen it firsthand. And uh, uh, I, 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 I have a very big problem with comparing uh, the government with the opposition, because I don't think it's a, pa a balanced comparison. You cannot compare uh, individuals who are not really organized, who don't, uh, who are, their weapons are basically, if you must say, Molotov cocktails, with government which has all the support from the international community as well as the arms and uh, anything. You, of course, you know you have been in Bahrain. You cannot make this comparison. It is not fair, first of all. Okay. So if you want to make this analysis, you have to differentiate between First, the fact that, okay, this is an organized government that, that uh, have their own army and the, the tools that they can uh, attack with the others. And, and then you have those uh, individuals, even if they were organized, the best that they can achieve is mo uh, firing Molotov cocktails, and they are dangerous, and they happen in Bahrain, and it is wrong, and it has been making uh, worse, uh, the situation worse and, and worse. But, and, and, I mean, there are, of course, views for the audience here, that you know, this is a, a very limited. Basically, uh, I feel again pain when uh, someone calls the, what is happening in Bahrain violent. Why we we characterize most of the events that happen in Ukraine now and in Egypt and and, and, and in Syria as a, a peaceful resistance. It makes me painful. It, it okay. is painful to me because you are talking about Bahrain for God's sake. You live yes. in Bahrain. People, the most peaceful people in the world, they don't even know how to use armed forces. They have never been part of a war. So you have to be fair in this characterization. You can accuse any, I mean, of course, the opposition has done a lot of harm throughout the, the, the struggle and even before for not being organized or for not uh, standing up to, to the, the people. But don't try to kind of make it as a, you know, an, an organized effort that is being, uh, you know, there is this uh, the theory that there is support from outside because these are legitimate, and I don't go through the, the political demands and why is this happening. This is a very important, I'm sure many of the people in the room know exactly why the political situation in Bahrain, why is this happening? Why are these people resisting? What happened really? And you mentioned, okay, there are all the human rights violations by the police, they happen everywhere. Yeah, that's fine. Let's just leave it happen that way. So I don't think it is, it's, it's fair to leave that happen since it's, it keeps happening. What, what has happened since 2012 until now, you mentioned many things hinting that Iran is involved. And of course, there were a big uh, uh, report, right. as well as so many other reports. Even the government until now did not uh, even show one evidence that Iran was involved. In fact, even President Obama himself mentioned Bahrain twice in, in several speeches. You, you mentioned that there was no attention. No, there was attention, of course. And these evidence show it. In fact, the State Department's latest report on the situation in Bahrain showed the, the, actually showed the a clear situation inside Bahrain that there have been so many human rights violations from the, that the, Bahrain, the government is not committed to the BICI recommendations, that all the reforms that have been promised by the king, which was a great effort, BICI was a great effort, but where is the result? So again, you, you go back to the same problem again, which is the political issue, that you have an authoritarian, uh, the, to shorten it, I don't wanna go long, but go ahead, we please. are talking about a region, which I call it actually in some of my articles, the, uh, the, the only remaining absolute monarchies in the world. This is, in a nutshell, the, what we are dealing with in Bahrain. And Bahrain started this change in the whole Gulf, and the reason why this became a big issue is Bahrain is literally the door for change in the rest of the Gulf region, because it's interconnected with everything in, in the region, in Saudi Arabia, and in Kuwait, and in Qatar, and it's already happened. It is not sectarian. Sectarian religion is, is spreading, obviously, because of the social context, but politically speaking, if, and I don't agree with you that the government was almost going to be overthrown. How can they be, be overthrown with a, a bunch of guys going on the street and protesting while the whole world was supporting the government? It was, uh, in fact, 
a kind of a, um, I would say an, an, an a symbol. Uh, inter the, the, the troops entering the Bahrain was a symbol to show, you know, solidarity from the Gulf that, by the way, what is happening, the 600,000 people who are protesting are not just protesting one region, they are protesting a system, a six governments in the whole Gulf region, and the, the change is not acceptable by the whole Gulf region. This was the sign. I'm Thank sorry. Thank you so much. So um, we need to just be respectful of the new group that needs to I'm come sorry. in, so we just run a... a if, is there one more quick question for... And then that'll, well, that'll you know, have to be. I, I, I just have to answer. First of all, man, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I respect the fact that there are differences, and you have your right to speak that. I could have come up here and gave a smooth message. There's a lot of pressure in my business to do that. Speak nice, easy kind of speeches here. We all like that, don't we? But I think my ethical duty as a scholar is to speak truthfully on this. I, I think there are real issues, but you lose complete legitimacy when the Shia opposition uses murder as a weapon of political change, man. When those police when those police are run over and Molotov cocktails kill people and bombs go off, just like, please feel my pain. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I have more pain than me. Man, when I saw people hurt in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know what that makes the Taliban and those insurgents completely illegitimate? I think your argument is wonderful till it gets to the point when violence is used against the forces. No matter how bad they may be, there's no justification of killing police, setting bombs off, and burning places down. There's absolutely the no, no, ju no, just, no justification for against that. 